Thank you all for coming. Um, we're super excited to talk to you today about animal reintroduction. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about who we are and what our agencies do before we start. Um, so as you see, I am with the Forest Service. Um, the lovely White River National Forest is the forest that we are in right now. We are the, in the easternmost ranger district out of five ranger districts comprising of 2.3 million acres. Um, it is a very large national forest in the, heart of the central Rockies. Um, so what we do at the Forest Service is a federal agency. We're part of the United States, United States Department of Agriculture. We're separate from the Park Service, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management. Those are all under the Department of Interior. Um, so us as an agency, we like to focus on multiple uses. So not only recreation, timber sale management. Um, we also work um, with many partnering agencies like Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, working on making sure we have a adequate habitat for their animals, for the wildlife, for the fisheries. We have hydrologists, biologists, archaeologists, um, recreation specialists, um, trail crews that all work um, together to make sure the forest is sustainable for everybody. And Alex is going to talk about what he does at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Right on. Yeah, so yeah, my name is Alex Strasser. I am the local Summit County Wildlife Officer, Game Warden, District Wildlife Manager. That's all me. So I'm your local Summit County guy. My agency, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, we focus on everything from wildlife, you know, their habitat, their wildlife interactions with humans. Um, you know, in a booming county like Summit County, when towns are always expanding, we're kind of managing to find a good balance between our wildlife habitat and our populations of humans. So that's a big thing here. Um, and our agency is all across the state. I am in Summit County. We have officers in every county in the state. Certain busier areas, we have multiple game wardens, multiple wildlife officers. It just depends on the area. Um, so yeah, I really just manage the wildlife or habitat. So everything from bears, moose, mountain lions, elk, deer, you name it. Also do a bunch of fisheries stuff, um, you know, managing our local wild populations of trout, our high alpine lakes, things like that. You name it, I'm managing it. So thank you. There's a bear right behind you. Oh yeah? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. <laughs> It is a bear. Yeah, so basically, long story short, um, Forest Service is federal, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is state. Um, so for any questions related to hunting, fishing, any kind of wildlife management, that usually goes to the state. Um, anything related to recreation, hiking, hunting, or not hunting, hiking, um, biking, climbing, um, any kind of uh, recreation, special use permit, anything like that will go to the Forest Service. Um, that being said, um, our office is in Silverthorne. Their office is in Hot Sulphur Springs. Um, so we are a lot closer to everybody here. So um, you're always welcome to give us a call or stop by our office if you have any wildlife concerns, and we can always pass them on to our wildlife manager here. Um, so we're going to talk today about, as you can see, we're going to use, um, sorry, it's not super duper big, um, but um, Summit County TV is recording, um, so you should be able to see a bigger version of it. Um, but there, we're going to be talking about animal reintroduction. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. Um, so basically, I wanted to ask you guys, um, did you know there are two animals here that we think of as synonymous to Colorado that are actually not native to Colorado? And I wonder if any of you guys can guess what the animals are by looking at this table. <laughs> so yes, a moose is one. And do you guys know the pelt of that animal? The mountain goat. Yes. So these are two animals, um, like I said, that are actually not native to Colorado, that have been introduced to Colorado. Um, with Colorado Parks and Wildlife in partnership with other agencies such as the Forest Service. Um, so today in our topic, in our presentation, we're going to be talking about um, why and how non-native animals like the moose and the mountain goat came to be in Colorado. Um, there are some benefits for the animals to be in Colorado, but there's also an impact either to the animal environment um, that humans can cause or an overall impact that um, the animals receive or an impact that the animals create when they're introduced to Colorado, right? So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. It's great that we have um, benefits <coughs> for when mountain goat and moose come to Colorado. We'll talk about those benefits in a little bit, um, but it also affects, the ha the, affects their habitat, it affects the habitat of other wildlife and vegetation when they're introduced. Um, and it also really affects um, how we see recreation in the community as well. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about how everybody here can do their part to protect the habitat. Um, not just the moose and the mountain goat, but just um, wildlife tips in general. Um, so basically what we're going to, our summary of our talk is going to be saying that animal reintroduction presents opportunity for environmental benefits and diversity, um, but natural 
and human impacts could threaten this harmony. Do you want to talk about Phoenix? Yeah. You're going right in the moose? <laughs> the mountain goat. Oh. All right, so mountain goat. Contrary to popular belief, mountain goats were not here originally. They are an introduced species. Now, mountain goats and bighorn sheep, another one of our more alpine critters running around here in lovely Colorado, they share the same habitat. So in the past, mountain goats were not here, bighorn sheep were. Um, you know, and kind of over time, folks in my position in the past, we kind of went, hey, what if we put mountain goats here? You know, bighorn sheep are here, they share the same habitat. I think that'd be a really good thing, you know, for our ecosystems, be a way to bring in money, uh, to manage other habitats, things like that. So that's kind of what the main draw to having mountain goats was. Um, so mountain goats, I think it was about 100 or so years ago was their first, mm -hmm. give or take, first reintroduction of mountain goats. Um, it was in the Mount Evans area, which I'm sure quite a few are familiar with, just a little bit farther east from here. Um, and that was kind of where our first population of mountain goats was introduced. And they were introduced to be hunted. Now, the whole reasoning behind that was, you know, folks have to pay for a mountain goat tag, which I don't know if you have the actual dollar amount. Yeah, it's, in the, it's on the second sheet. It's a couple thousand, I think it's $2,500 for a non-resident mountain goat tag. Um, now, you can imagine a lot of folks want to hunt mountain goats. You know, it's a very big trophy animal. It's good to eat, things like that. So when folks are paying for, for these hunting tags, that's a lot of revenue that's coming in to manage other wildlife in our state. And it's not just to manage mountain goats, you know, it's to, mount, to manage all of our critters. So elk, deer, you name it, all that money is going towards conservation for our species here in Colorado. So that was kind of the main reasoning behind reintroducing the mountain goats. And then just over time, you know, as our mountain goats started to strive in our areas here, they started to outcompete our native bighorn sheep. So that kind of just kept the need for having hunting on these species to help keep our mountain goat populations in check. Like I said, they share the same habitat with bighorn sheep, so it was really kind of, you know, as time goes on, we want to keep our populations in check, so that's a big thing for hunting. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to touch on that? Yeah, all right, so a couple other fun facts about the goat. Um, it is not actually a goat. It is a different family than the domesticated goat that we know of today. Um, so, but the reason why they're kind of in the same almost classification um, is because of their, their shaggy fur, their horns, um, so they're under the same order but not the same family because of those physical characteristics. Um, and if you imagine, right, if you're kind of wanting to move to a new habitat, um, you have to adapt in certain ways. Uh, maybe you have to, if you're going to a colder climate, maybe you'll have to pack some extra cold clothes if you come from a warmer climate. But these animals didn't have a choice, right? They were just picked up and moved here. And the great thing about these animals, the moose and the mountain goat, is they were able to naturally adapt to the environment. So if you see our, our lovely mountain goat pelt here, um, you can come touch it afterwards. Um, it's really, really thick and it has two layers. So it has the really, really warm, soft fur underneath to keep it warm, but then this rough shaggy fur on top um, is so for water resistance. So it's gonna be wading through a lot of ice and snow and wind. Um, so this is gonna keep it warm, but also keep the moisture out. And if you think about the mountain goats who you usually don't see them down here, right? They're in the top of the sheer rocky cliffs. And they have these really cool hooves that are hard on the outside and soft and cushiony on the inside that keeps them um, able to keep traction on the really steep slopes, um, just like they do in their native Canadian rocky habitat. Um, so yeah, so that's why they've able, been able to survive and thrive up here. Um, one last thing, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a mountain goat, but they have horns, right? And their horns can be sharp enough to penetrate a vehicle. Um, so that's a really good reason for you guys to keep your distance. Um, so I don't know, if, have you guys heard of the rule of thumb? Yeah, so if Alex was a goat, I'd be in trouble. Um, I'm not far <laughs> enough away. Um, yeah, so basically you want to be able to cover the animal with your thumb, and that way you're a safe distance away. Um, goats, can, goats and moose, um, they can be pretty territorial. Um, also, another thing we like to talk about the goats, um, like Alex said, it's a really good um, environmental or economic advantage. Resident tag um, is $346. A non-resident tag is over $2,500. Um, so all those tags together bring in a lot of money for Colorado Parks and Wildlife to manage the habitat. Um, and also, like he said, it keeps a big balance between the bighorn sheep um, by carrying capacity. Um, but there's also some human impacts to the goats, especially on Mount Evans. Um, as you can see here, maybe you can't, but 
there is a picture here of these kids and there's a little paintball on the one of the kids. And this is because there was a spread of E. coli a couple of years ago spreading around the mountain goat kids and there was a lot of fatalities. So Colorado Parks and Wildlife was using paintballs to track these sick goats to see if they would survive or not. Um, to my understanding, they were never, they didn't, were not able to deduce what, what happened no. other than that it was E. coli. Um, but I don't know if you've ever been up on Mount Evans well, there's a lot of mountain goats and bighorn sheep, and they have been noticing a lot of really unnatural behaviors. Um, so they would go really close to people. They would start to lick the cars um, and other behaviors that aren't natural um, that kind of grew cause for concern. Not only the mountain goats, but the bighorn sheep as well, um, because sometimes people would feed them. Um, and they're just not used to that, or maybe they are getting used to it. So that's why they're getting closer and closer to the people. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. Um, I've also heard of instances in the Willow and Salmon Lakes, mountain goats following people around, getting pretty territorial, um, possibly because people were feeding them in the past and they are expecting that food, so they come to try to approach the people to eat it. Um, and if they don't get fed, they can become aggressive, just like any other animal. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, yes. So yeah, we have, they've been observed as um, putting their heads inside of open car windows, um, running towards the sound of crinkling food wrappers, um, entering restrooms and tolerating large groups of people. Um, mountain goats, much like the bighorn sheep, they like salts. Um, guess where salt comes from? In your urine. And so sometimes if people don't use the facilities adequately, um, they're going to be out and about in the trailheads, in the parking lots. Um, so yes, and also people, reports of moose, um, sorry, goats, um, chasing down people in the backcountry as well. So now we talked about the moose, or sorry, the mountain goat. We talked about why it was introduced, the economic benefits, um, but some of the impacts um, recreation has had on them um, and the un unnatural behaviors they've displayed. Um, so now we're going to talk about our next animal, the moose. Um, it is the Shira subspecies, um, and it is the smallest of eight subspecies, and Alex will talk a little bit more about those facts. Yeah. I'd say just disease in general is always a concern, especially when you're moving critters around. Um, just this spring, we had a bighorn sheep over by Target and Silverthorn hanging around that mountainside there, and it was there for a long time, and we didn't really want to move it. You know, first thing you would think about, oh, let's just put it back with the herd, and, you know, and put it back with his family, it'll be fine. But we kind of just talking with other officers, we're thinking about, well, what if this thing is just, maybe it has a disease, you know, we don't want to reintroduce it. Um, back to a herd, and even though it'll probably be fine, we just don't want to take that rest of that risk of wiping out an entire herd. So that's always something you're considering, whether it's ringworm, um, you know, anything like that, any sort of disease. We always, if it comes down there, you can certainly tranquilize something and test it before you move it, if it's that important to get a critter out of where it's hanging around. So it's something we're always considering. Do you want, do you want to talk about Yeah, moose. Um, <laughs> oh, there's one other thing I was going to touch on for. Uh, mountain goat. So something a little bit closer to home is the Blue Lakes area, that lower Blue Lakes trailhead in that lake. I'm sure some of you folks have been over there. Um, there's quite a bit of mountain goats that'll hang around that parking lot and, you know, lick salt off of cars. So that's just another example of goats kind of taking the best opportunity to get their nutrients and their food. You know, this might not be right to, or natural to be eating from humans and licking salt off of cars, but they're just taking advantage of what they have. So, um, but yeah, moose. Uh, moose are what, introduced 100 years, 50 years we, ago? Let's see, um, 1950s. Yeah, so our first moose population was reintrodu introduced in 1950. Um, right. I'll get to that. <laughs> so before then, we did have moose in Colorado, but it wasn't a consistent and stable population. We kind of meandered down south from Wyoming, um, kind of in that North Park area, and that's really where they were hanging around. So the Walden, Steamboat Springs, that part of the state. Um, and kind of the same story like the mountain goat, you know, our biologists, our wildlife managers were going, hey, you know, these moose are coming down here for a reason. We have good habitat for them. Let's bring them over here and see how they do. And as I'm sure you folks know, they're here and they're doing well. Um, but yeah, the first population was reintroduced in North Park. They're actually brought in, I believe, by helicopter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was a group of maybe 11 or 12 to that North Park area. Yeah, there's a picture right there. They're kind of heli lifted in, dropped in. Um, you know, we found a good habitat that was suitable for them. We didn't want to just dump them in a desert or on top of a mountain like a mountain goat. So we found a good wetland area, um, you know, with willows. Moose stands for twig eater. So they like to eat that type of stuff. 
Um, so we dropped them there, and they're doing well. Now they're all over the state. Here in Summit County, we have a very, very stable and healthy moose population. We have tons of wetlands, riparian areas. Um, so they're striving here as well, and it's good to see. And just like the mountain goat, we are hunting moose as well. And it's just another big revenue thing. Hunters love to hunt them. It's a very challenging hunt. And as you can imagine, if you shoot a full-grown bull moose, that's going to feed you for a long time. Um, so yeah, that's just the whole reason behind the moose reintroduction. Yeah, so the adult, this is the, the subspecies that's in our area, the Shira subspecies. Um, it is the smallest of eight subspecies, um, but it, they are still pretty big. Um, the adult Colorado moose, the, the bull, can weigh up to 1,000 pounds and stand six feet at the shoulder, which is obviously taller than me, um, and can run up to 35 miles an hour. Um, so actually they were historically wandering around the, this area, what, is, what, was, what was Colorado back in the 1850s, but they were pretty transient and they weren't staying in the same place. Um, so as Alex was saying, um, they were considering yeah, introducing the moose in the 1950s and then the first moose were introduced, uh, 24 of them were introduced in 1974 um, into the Walden area. Um, so I think the last time they measured population for the reintroduction was in 2012. There was about 2,300 moose. Um, and then for the uh, population estimate in 2022 post-hunting season, it was 3,460. 3, um, so yeah, they've, they've grown quite a bit in population. Um, as Alex was saying, um, their name is Algonquin for twig eater. Um, so they like to eat willows and creeks, and luckily Colorado has a lot of them. They don't have a lot of natural predators either, um, although they do have poor eyesight. So they have to rely on their other senses um, to if they feel threatened. Um, so in terms of economic benefits, um, a non-resident moose tag, um, similar to a goat, is over $2,500. Um, and there's a lot of folks that come out here to try to get the moose. Um, so yeah, it brings a lot of economic benefit. Um, and also um, hunting, I, and Alex can speak more to this, um, but um, hunting can be used as a, pop bless you, as a population um, tool, population management tool. So if uh, we had mountain goats or moose, um, if their populations were just left unchecked and they were wanting to roam free, um, there could be impacts, such as other impacts that would threaten um, the wildlife, such as disease, loss of habitat, um, or more animal wildlife human conflicts if the population is not managed correctly. Um, and then I'm gonna flip to the map of the animal, the moose reintroduction. I don't know if you guys can see here, um, but we have a whole map of Colorado, and these are the different areas where the moose were reintroduced. So this black um, hashed area is where the moose release areas, and this is a timeline down here. So this is the Walden area, and then this red outline is going to be the moose hunting areas, which presumes that moose are going to be down, living down in that area. So as you can see, from 1974 to today, the moose have migrated down quite a ways. So they started by, kind of close to the Wyoming border, Steamboat Springs. They've gone all the way down into Park County here. Um, and then they've had other introduce, uh, introducing areas. Um, so they have the San Juans. So they were released here in, I believe, 1991 to 1993. And now their habitat has grown a lot. And uh, we're going to be emailing these slides later so you guys can take a closer look at this. This is also available online as a part of the Moose Introduction Fact Sheet. Uh, but it's pretty interesting to see how we've only had a, a handful of moose release uh, points and how much their habitat has grown since then. Um, we're also going to talk about um, impacts to moose. Um, so it's great for the moose. We have lots of willows. We have lots of creeks. Um, they have really long legs so they can trample through the snow. Um, so like, just, like, just like the mountain goat, they've been able to adapt to this environment really, really, excuse me, really, really well. Um, however, um, because we live in a what we call a wild and urban interface, um, which mean, which is defined as a developed area that is adjust, adjacent to some wildlife habitat, which is we call the White River National Forest in our area, um, we have had some human impacts on the do on the moose. So, first thing we're going to talk about is dogs. So, Coloradans, we love our dogs. Um, we like to take our dogs for walks all the time. However, moose, as we said before, moose don't have many natural predators, but dogs are one of them, or at least they perceive dogs to be one of them. So wolves, wolves um, are natural predators to moose. And so moose, because they don't have poor eyesight, they hear a dog, if they smell a dog, they're gonna think of it as a threat. And this is especially pertinent in the spring during their calving season when they have their babies. 
Um, so it was really, we try to really, really stress the importance of having your dog on a leash, even if you're not in the wilderness area. So wilderness area, like Lily Pad Lake, Mesa Cortina, um, Tarmigan, any of those trails that lead into wilderness areas, dogs are required to be on a leash at all times um, because what can happen? Um, if a dog wanders off, uh, maybe it encounters a moose. The moose thinks of the dog as a threat. It starts to charge the dog. Well, guess what? The dog is going to run back to you. And then what happens after that? Yeah. So now you have a dog and a moose charging after you. So it's not safe for you. It's not safe for the dog. It's also not safe for the moose. Um, because any kind of he moose human conflict can um, create more risk for the moose as well. Um, so we really, really encourage people, even if you're not in a wilderness area, to always keep your dog on leash because there are moose everywhere in this county. Um, we've had instances of dogs actually being trampled to death. Um, in Frisco, I think two years ago, um, the dog named Arlo, um, who was in the Mount Royal Mason Town Rainbow Lakes area. And yeah, same. This, what I just described just happened. Um, the dog was off leash, um, came between a moose and its calf. Um, the mama moose charged the dog and stomped it. So um, it's really, really sad, um, but it's a really important lesson um, for it to always be mindful of that when you're walking with your dogs. Um, so moose also like to winter in lower elevation riparian areas, just like who else? Like us. Yes. <laughs> like humans do too. Um, so they love their creeks, they love their willows, um, but guess what? We also like to build our houses there too because we're right by a creek and we're by a willow and it's really, really pretty. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, I mean, sometimes it's, there's already development happening, but it's something to keep in mind um, as our beautiful community is expanding. Um, this is just something that happens when we're in a place that everybody wants to be, which is understandable, um, but we're also having to share you know, our, our home with the wildlife. Um, and also, it's really important to know about what happens if you encounter a moose. Um, what are some of the warning signs for an attack? And if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So if you counter, encounter a moose, first probably natural instinct would be to take a picture. Maybe if you're <laughs> well-versed, you've lived here for a while, you might not. But a lot of folks want to take a picture, run up to it, try to pet it, maybe even. It's probably not a good sign. Um, so, you know, just look at it. You can watch it. Just don't get too close. Respect its distance. Some good signs to look for. So if its ears are pinned back, that means it's upset. If it starts licking its lips, that means it's upset. If its hair is all puffed up. That means it's upset. Um, heads down real low, that means it's upset. So basically anything that just kind of, you know, just a lot of things that I can be doing that's a good sign, just okay, maybe I should back up or go the other way. And like Marissa was saying, if you do have a dog, um, you know, moose like to think dogs are wolves and wolves are their natural predator. So they're gonna be come in the defensive mode. So they might charge that dog and the dog's gonna run back to you and who knows what's gonna happen next. Um, another thing is if you happen to be in between a cow moose and its calf, that's probably worst case scenario. Um, you know, just a good thing to do is, again, just back up slowly. Don't try to run off. That might trigger some sort of, not predatorial thing, because moose aren't really predators, but they might just trigger a chase instinct and it might start chasing you. A lot of joggers, especially in Summit County, end up getting chased by a moose, maybe a couple miles even. That's happened quite a bit this spring and this mm -hmm. summer. Um, so it's just a weird thing that they like to do. Maybe they want to go for a jog just because they see you jogging. Um, but yeah, there's just, couple things. It's different from like a bear or a mountain lion. Um, if you do come across one of those, you might try to challenge it, act big and scare it off. Don't do that to a moose. It's just going to stare at you and be like, what the heck is this person doing? Um, but yeah, that's kind of just some tips in case you encounter a moose out there. I actually this spring had a moose chase me around my truck for about 10 minutes and it never got to me. So it could work. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything, any large object between you and the moose, um, the other thing, uh, I don't know if you guys saw that video from, I think, March in Big Sky, Montana. The guy recording um, two tourists from across the road poking the moose. The guy recording the video was like, hey, don't do that. The tourists were like, ha, 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 you're so silly, what could happen? Um, and then the moose, lo and behold, the moose starts to charge the guy, and he's yelling and screaming. And the guy across the street is kind of laughing as he's recording the video. Um, so don't be that person. Uh, <laughs> basically, is the moral of that video. Um, I think we all know it because we... Um, you know, maybe we visit here, we know that we are familiar with the outdoors in the area, um, but it's always a good um, reminder to tell your friends and family who are visiting from out of town who maybe have never seen a moose before. Um, I'm, I'm a transplant myself. Um, I had never seen a moose before coming out to Colorado, and I thankfully was um, 
conditioned to steer moose. Um, so the first time I encountered one, um, it's fine. Um, first time was in a car, second time was on a hiking trail. Um, both times I kind of just stayed back, hid behind a tree or stayed in my car and kind of watched it. And it was really chill. It was just kind of walking around. It looked at me, it looked another way, and then it wandered off. Um, no harm done. And I got to see a moose hang out, which is great. Um, so I think that's the way it should be. Um, another thing we have to th consider uh, when a lot of folks like to um, build their homesteads here is they want to plant really awesome plants. Uh, we do also encourage people um, for reasons like water conservation, but also reasons like animal safety um, to plant native plants um, in your backyards, in your front of your homes. Um, so one of the plants that is looks really, really nice but is not, not native to Colorado and is really toxic to the moose is called the U plant, the Y-E-W. Uh, we've had um, moose calf fatalities from consuming U plants in our county. Um, I know we had one this, this year in Breckenridge, and I think there was a couple... Um, a couple years ago in Silverthorn, a couple calves passed away from eating, from you poisoning. Um, so please be mindful of the plants you're making. Um, also another point when we were talking about keeping your distance, um, I know I feel like a lot of us know this already, but we had a really tragic incident in Steamboat Springs of a moose calf that was orphaned and was able to be reintroduced to a mom, a mama moose. Um, and somehow this moose calf ended up on the top of a parking structure in Steamboat Springs. And then all these visitors saw it and were crowding it and trying to take a picture. Miss Moose Calf tried to escape. Uh, it fell off the parking structure and unfortunately passed away. Um, so this is always something to keep in mind um, when we see wildlife. Um, it's really, really important to use the rule of thumb, keep our distance and protect the wildlife. Um, like I said, we live in a wildland urban interface. Um, so a lot of things we can do to help um, are keeping a safe distance, the rule of thumb, um, adhering to the leave no trace policies. I don't know if you're aware of it, if you're aware of the policies, um, you know, digging your cat hole, um, making sure you don't take anything like flowers or rocks, um, make, respecting wildlife. Um, a lot of one of our forest service regulations for camping is you have to camp at least 100 feet away from any body of water. Um, that's because all our moose friends like to eat, like to drink from the creeks and if they see a tent or something nearby, they might be discouraged from accessing that water source. Um, so it's really important to keep in mind um, using native plants and also um, not feeding the wildlife. That's really, I know we've touched on that a couple times um, because the moose were here, we, like we introduced the moose here, but it's also our duty to not only protect um, the wildlife, but make sure that they are sustained by following these principles. Do you have anything to add? No, that was perfect. What? Yes, thank you for doing, thank you for saying that. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've been on a trail and I see a neon colored plastic bag full of poop that's just sitting on the trail. Um, so not only are you not picking up your poop, but you're leaving it in a maybe not decompostable bag that's just sitting there. Um, and are they going to come back to pick up the poop? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's, I feel like it's the pet owner's responsibility to pick up after the dog poop. Um, if you want to hike with your dog, you should devise a system to be prepared to pack with pack your poop with you as you're hiking. Um, I've seen hacks of like people cleaning out a peanut butter jar and putting the dog poop bags in a peanut butter jar, um, so that way it's sturdy and it's not going like, to get smushed in your pack or anything like that. Um, but just like um, any kind of poop, um, dog poop, animal poop, um, it has bacteria, it has, dise uh, has diseases, it can seep into the ground, it can seep into water systems, and it can affect the wildlife that use that water. Do you have anything to add to that? No, that's good. Real good. Yeah, thank you guys. I guess we'll move into questions if anybody has anything. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Can you talk about moose horns? I mean, how long did it take? Yeah, well, so this moose, these antlers were here before I even started. Um, so I just kind of inherited them. I would guess, you know, looking at this rack, I would say this moose is probably at least five years old, maybe right around four and a half, five years. And actually an interesting fact, I don't know if any, a lot of folks know this, but how they're shaped like this, it actually echoes sound. So you know, when they're looking for a mate and they're making out those calls, it really helps bellow that sound across the valley or a mountain drainage, things like that, which is, I thought it was kind of neat. I didn't really know that until a couple minutes ago, actually. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything okay. else? Um, another cool thing about the antlers um, is so it's a kind of an adaptation tool that like the mountain goats have their really thick shaggy double coated fur. Um, the moose also shed their antlers every year as an adaptation um, for the winter. So 
um, in the winter months, right, um, they need to conserve all the energy in order to survive the cold, survive the snow, survive the winter. So they shed their antlers um, in order to regrow them in the spring. Um, because if they were to try to have the antlers on their head, it will be a lot of energy to keep all that weight on their head 365 days a year. Um, so yeah, there's a whole antler cycle um, where they shed their antlers, they grow them back. It's really, really velvety at first, and then they scratch them against the tree to get the velvet off. Um, and then as that process happens, a new prong um, can grow. And then in the fall, there's the rutting season, which is where you might hear the clacking. Um, if you're hiking around Frisco or Breckenridge, that's the males um, clacking their horns together um, for mating. So that's another really good time to make sure your dogs are on a leash is the spring and the fall, the calving season and the rutting season. Um, Cobb Parks and Wildlife, um, our lovely friends, they have a state law that prohibits um, shed hunting um, from the months of January to end of April. Um, and the reason for this is because um, there can be, in the past, there's been like a controversy, almost like a black market for, antl or for moose antlers. Um, people would go out into the winter, um, try to get the moose to shed their antlers, or just being out in the moose habitat in the middle of winter when they're trying to survive is super duper stressful. Um, and it can really decrease the chances of animal survival. Um, so that's why there's a law in place now to protect those animal habitats. Um, so you can only collect shed, sheds, um, so when a moose sheds its antlers, um, between the months of May and November, December. December. Um, anywhere west of I-25, which is where we are. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically the summary of our talk. Um, so we've talked about um, the economic benefits of introducing the moose and the goats, right? Um, hunting tags are super duper expensive, especially for out of state. It brings a lot of money for Colorado Parks and Wildlife to manage to keep managing the habitats and staffing. Um, we talked about how well the animals have naturally adapted to this habitat. Um, but then we also talked about the fact that there's a lot of people that live here as well. And sometimes um, human populations and recreation um, can encroach on these habitats. Um, and it's important to have these habitats or these wildlife um, populations maintained either by hunting or other laws, hunting and also protected. Um, so that way there's a, there's a healthy balance of um, animals and then the native animals and vegetation in Colorado as well.